Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series of lessons is entitled Present Truth in Deuteronomy. Present in Moses' day when he wrote it, or present in our day, or both. Well, this is lesson number eight for November 20 of 2021, entitled Choose Life. Now, that sounds like a good idea, right? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind, wonderful, loving Father, we bow before you now, recognizing that you've offered us something beyond our, even our wildest dreams. You offered to give us eternal life. May that be our experience, each one, as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. It's always a sad story. A young person, in this case, a 22-year-old woman diagnosed with a deadly disease, brain tumor. Gordon, how often are those things treated successfully? Successfully or temporarily? No, I said successfully. You're asking the almost impossible. Yeah. Even with all the marvels of modern medicine, nothing can be done until the inevitable. But this young woman, Sandy, didn't want to die. So she had a plan. After she died, her head would be put in a deep freeze into a vat of liquid nitrogen in hopes of preserving her brain cells. And there would wait 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, until sometime in the future when technology had advanced enough so that her brain, composed of neural connections, could then be uploaded into a computer. And yes, Sandy could live on maybe even forever. Wow. Sad story, not just because a young person was going to die, but because of where she put her hope, where she put her hope of life. Like most people, Sandy wanted life, wanted to live, but she chose a path that, in the end, surely won't work. And that's from our Bible study guide for November 13. In this lesson, we're all talking about this together, we will discuss the choices placed before Adam and Eve and also before the children of Israel, as well as the encouragement by God to choose life over death. Now that seems so obvious. I mean, if I offer someone life or death, there's a few people who are crazy and would choose death. But I mean, the overwhelming majority would choose what? Life. life. Well, we did not have the opportunity to choose to be born. That choice was not in our hands. So who was the only human being in history that was able to choose his parents? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus Christ. What do you think of his choices? If you read Matthew 1, there's some very interesting people in that list. Some dubious <laughs> parents. Come on grandparents. now. Mary's ancestors. Yeah. <laughs> Even Adam and Eve did not choose to be created. We may have experienced them we may have existence as they did and life as they did because God has made us free, rational beings able to choose. Review what the Bible teaches about the history of the entrance of sin. Jim? Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And Genesis. Excuse me, what did I say? Deuteronomy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Genesis 2, verses 8 and 9 and 15 through 17. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the, the man he had formed. He made all kinds of beautiful trees grow where there had grow all kinds of beautiful trees grow there and produce good fruit. In the middle of the garden stood the tree that gives life and the tree that gives knowledge of good of what is good and what is bad. Then the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden in to cultivate it and guard it. He said to him, you may eat the fruit of any tree of the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. American Bible Society, 1992. <clears throat> okay, that expression, you will die the same day, could also be translated, you will certainly die. 
for those of us who accept all of Scripture, it is important to recognize that Revelation 12 talks about events that happened before the story of Adam and Eve. And what were those events? Lucifer rebelling. Heaven. The war in heaven, right? Because we, and how do we know that that happened before the days of Adam and Eve? Because he was because he was in the garden. Because yeah. he was here in the garden. God had given him a place here in the garden at the time when, when they were tempted, I mean, when, when the Garden of Eden was created. So, and in fact, it says over in Revelation 12 that he was cast down to this earth, doesn't and it? And not only alone. Yeah. One third of the yeah. created angels. So there was sin in the universe. Before, before there was sin here. Creation of, of this story we have in okay. Genesis 1. Well, notice these very interesting words from Ellen White about that time. Gary? In the midst of Eden grew the tree of life, whose fruit had the power of perpetuating life. Had Adam remained obedient to God, he would have continued to enjoy free access to this tree and would have lived forever. But when he sinned, he was cut off from partaking of the tree of life, and he became subject to death. The divine sentence Dust thou art, and under dust shalt thou return, points to the utter extinction of life. That's from Ellen G. White, The Great Controversy, page 532, paragraph 5 through 533. Satan actually believed, this is a very interesting quotation, I want you to pay careful attention. Satan actually believed that there was some magic and the tree of life, and that if he and his angels could deceive Adam and Eve and get them to sin, then he and his followers might be able to get access to the tree of life, rule this world, and live forever. Okay, this is a brand new idea for me that I just ran across in the writings of Ellen White. Gordon? From Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, and several other places, including Signs of the Times from 1879, his, Satan's followers, were seeking him, and he aroused himself, and assuming a look of defiance, informed them of his plans to wrest from God the noble Adam and his companion Eve. If he could in any way beguile them to disobedience, God would make some provision whereby they might be pardoned and then himself and all the fallen angels would be in a fair way to share with them of God's glory, God's mercy. <clears throat> if this should fail, they could unite with Adam and Eve. For when once they should transgress the law of God, they would be subjects of God's wrath, like themselves. Their transgression would place them also in a state of rebellion, and they could unite with Adam and Eve, take possession of Eden, and hold it as their home. And if they could gain access to the tree of life in the midst of the garden, their strength would, they thought, be equal to that of the holy angels. And even God himself could not expel them. Wow. We can take the tree of life. Yes. They, they and can, live forever. And there's an hour. If we had time, I would also share another passage where she talks about the fact that God had to put angels to protect the tree of life to keep Satan from getting there. I mean, you know, he's put the tree of knowledge of good and evil right there beside the tree of life. You know, Satan says, this is my place, but as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, he was ready to grab his chance. Right from the beginning, God wanted Adam and Eve to choose life. Those two trees in the Garden of Eden presented an existential choice. Choose life and live forever, or choose sin and die and disappear completely. But again, going back to uh, the Protestant church, all over the world believe that you live forever. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's so they've got to have a hell, yeah. because God's going to give blessings to the good, good guys. And, and, the, and the bad ones don't die, so what's he going to do for them? Yeah. You, you've got to have this hell that, uh, and then Satan comes along with all that thinking, is, and then he says, well, God, you're not fair. It's interesting to notice that the tree of life mentioned in the early chapters of Genesis is also mentioned in Revelation 2-7 and in Revelation 22, verses 2 and 14. 
in Revelation 2, verse 7. If you have ears, then, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To those who win victory, I will give the right to eat of the fruit of the tree of life that grows in the garden of God. That's from the Good News Bible. And then Revelation 22, verse 2 and 14. Flowing down the middle of the city street on each side of the river was the tree of life, which bears fruit 12 times a year, once each month, and its leaves are for the healing of nat nations. Happy are those who wash their robes clean and so have the right to eat the fruit of the tree of life and to go through the gates into the city. Mm -hmm. Good news, Bible. Okay, so why do you suppose all of a sudden we have Tree of Life way back there in the first book of the Bible, and all of a sudden now the Tree of Life appears again at the, in the last book of the Bible? The Is last there, book of the Bible came first in reality, historically. Yeah. Okay, that's... Some of it. Yeah. But God is trying to tell us that the great controversy flows behind the whole thing from beginning to end. How are we opting for life or for death every day by our choices? In what sorts of ways do our daily activities and choices affect our decision for life or death? When we make selfish choices each day, we are following the example of Satan. But when we make loving choices, we are following the example of Jesus. Collectively, these choices influence the way we make future choices, including the final choice for life or death. So every day we are making choices that lean us to one or the other side. Why is it that the Bible seems to present only two options? Aren't there at least three or four maybe? The Bible says life or death. Notice these verses from Scripture. John 3, <coughs> I'm sorry. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that everyone who believes in Him may not die, but have eternal life. Good news, Bible. Genesis 7, 22 and 23, Everything on earth that breatheth died. The Lord destroyed all living beings on the earth, human beings, animals, and birds. The only ones left were Noah and those who were with him in the boat. Good news Bible. Romans 6, 23. For sin pays its wages, death, but God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 6. To be controlled by human nature results in death. To be controlled by the Spirit results in life and peace. Good news Bible. First John 5, 12, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So what does it mean to have the Son or to choose the Son? We're not given the option of a sitting on the fence. We might do that for a little while, there's no middle ground. We either choose life or we choose death. We choose death by choosing to ignore or refuse God's offer of life. What will we choose? Ultimately, that answer rests with us. So what evidence do we have from Scripture about the final end of sin and sinners? Well, there's a couple of interesting verses in the Old Testament. Obadiah 15 and 16. Remember, Obadiah is one chapter, so these are the last two verses there. For the day the Lord draws near on all the nations, as you have done, will be, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. This is a little prophecy about the country of, of, of uh, Edom. Because just as you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed, New American Standard Bible. Edom, that's uh, Esau's. Descendants. Yes, these are Esau's descendants, that's correct. Malachi 4 might be even a little bit clearer in our English. The Lord Almighty says, the day is coming when all proud and evil people will burn like straw. I don't know if any of you have been in a place where straw is burned, how much is left? Nothing. 
virtually nothing. On that day they will burn up and there will be nothing left of them. On the day when I act, you will be overcome the wicked, you will overcome the wicked, and they will be like dust under your feet. Good news Bible. Okay, we've been talking about a lot of other verses, but now Deuteronomy 30, our main section for study for this week, suggests that even when we are disobedient, refuse to listen to God, He will still come after us, seek to benefit us if we will repent and return from our evil ways. We'll, we'll talk about that later, Deuteronomy 30, 15 to 20. Will we choose life, goodness and blessing, or will we choose death, evil and curses? In actual fact, when we choose Satan's way, we lose our ability to choose. But given the straightforward presentation of life or death, who would not choose life over death? It seems so obvious. So why do so many people choose to rebel against God? Well, to Seventh-day Adventists who have a more nearly complete understanding of the great controversy between good and evil, between God and Satan over the character and government of God, when we study the book of Deuteronomy, it might be puzzling to realize that Moses did not mention anything about the devil in that book. Why do you think that is? However, Moses did make a clear connection between love, the very basis of God's government, and obedience. So now, is it possible that Moses didn't have an understanding of the devil? He communicated directly with God. Wouldn't God tell him? And uh, if what God evidence? told him, why wouldn't he put it in the book? Yeah, because he already had in the book of in Job. Genesis, in Genesis. Well, in Job. In Job. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. have to repeat everything every time. Huh? Right, exactly. Um, Deuteronomy 30, 15 to 20. Today, I am giving you a choice between good and evil, between life and death. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God, which I give you today, if you love Him, obey Him, and keep all His laws, then you will prosper and become a nation of many people. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're about to occupy. But if you disobey and refuse to listen, and are led away to worship other gods, you will be destroyed. I warn you here and now, you will not live long in that land across the Jordan that you are about to occupy. I am now giving you the choice between life and death, between God's blessing and God's curse. And I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Choose life. Love the Lord your God, obey Him and be faithful to Him and then you and your descendants will live long in the land that he promised to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Deuteronomy 30 does not start out with talking about promises from God. Jim? Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 10. Moses reminded the children of Israel, I have now given you a choice between a blessing and a curse. When all these things have happened to you and you are living among the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you, you will remember the choice I gave you. If you and your descendants will turn back to the Lord and with all your heart obey his commands that I give you today, then the Lord your God will have mercy on you. He will bring you back from the nations that, where he has scattered you and he will make you prosperous again. Even if you are scattered in to the farthest corner of the earth, the Lord your God will gather you together and bring you back, so that you may again take possession of the land where your ancestors once lived. And let me, make, yeah, let me interrupt ahead. there for a second. I was looking at some material on the modern nation of Israel today, and I'm sure they say, this land is ours. God promised it to us right there, right? And all of them came back after the Holocaust and all that kind of stuff? They came back after the Babylonian captivity, about 1% sure. of them. Yeah. They came back in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Even if you are scattered to the farthest corners of the earth, the Lord your God will gather you together and bring you back 
so that you may again take possession of the land where your ancestors once lived. And he will make you more prosperous and more numerous than your ancestors ever were. The Lord your God will give you and your descendants obedient hearts so that you will love him with all your heart and you will continue to live in that land. He will turn all these curses against your enemies who hated you and oppressed you and you will again obey him and keep all his commandments that I am giving you today. The Lord will make you your excuse me the Lord will make you prosperous in all that you do. You will have children have many children and a lot of livestock and your fields will produce abundant crops. He will be glad to make you prosperous as he was to make your ancestors prosperous. prosperous. But you will have to obey him and keep all his laws that are written in this book of his teachings. You will have to turn to him with all your heart. Good News Bible. Wow. And yeah, I mean, you can each line that goes, you can say, well, that happened there, that happened there, that happened there. And yet this was written a thousand years before it happened. Yep. God knows what is coming. He understands the condition of human hearts. However, he offers promises of his love and care if they will simply return to their allegiance and obedience to him. Shouldn't that have been a very comfortable, comforting thought? What do you suppose those who were going off into Assyrian or Babylonian captivity thought about these verses? Then God went the extra step and said, Gary? Reading from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14. The command that I'm giving you today is not too difficult or beyond your reach. It is not up in the sky. You do not have to ask who will go up and bring it down for us so that we can hear it and obey it, nor is it on the other side of the ocean. You do not have to ask who will go across the ocean and bring it to us so that we may hear it and obey it. No, it is here with you. You know it and can quote it. So now obey it. And that's from the Good News Bible. In ancient times, it was believed that different portions of the earth, even different individual countries, were given different gods to rule over them. The Assyrians, for example, the one the nation that conquered the northern tribe, the northern country of Israel later, their god was the god of war. And he stood for other things as well, but especially he was the god of war. It was believed that if one was taken into captivity in another country, she or he might have to worship the God of that country in order to get one's prayers answered. This would pose a great problem for those already in captivity. But God made it very clear in Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 14, that he is always present. He is always with us. It is not necessary to send an emissary to bring God back to us. Do we understand clearly God's will for us? Do we understand fully what it would mean to cooperate with him in every detail of our lives? What impact might that have on us? From Ellen White in Christ's Objects Lessons, page 333. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Wow. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings are enablings. What does that mean? If we pray for someone to be healed or saved, All is, that, is that according to his will? Yeah. But everything that God bids us do, he allows us to do. He enables us to do. So Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Yeah. He's given us the capability now. He says, uh, if does God, uh, excuse me, you pray to God that somebody, God will save somebody. How does that work? You mean is he going to violate somebody's uh, freedom? Or is he, is he going to continue to provide information and, and, and uh, reveal himself to them? But if they, aren't they still free to reject it? Or they just, we understand save is healing. Mm -hmm. And what needs healing? My pancreatic cancer or my 
Smart. way I think about God. Yep. Go ahead. From Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 668. All true obedience comes from the heart, which is the mind. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, <clears throat> that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Wow. The will refined and sanctified, will find its greatest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Mm. We will hate sin. Wow, Desire of Ages 668. How many people... That's in, an amazing statement. Mm -hmm. How many people in their lives have prayed well, what the Lord's will is? Well, should they go into this line of work or such, do such and such a thing? Or should they uh, go, go on a missionary trip? Uh, and, the, the, and, and it doesn't seem to, uh, to work out. Yeah. Or if it does work out, and then the thing goes south on them, then who do they blame? Well, and I'm, I'll give you an example. My, my sister, years ago, she wanted to go work for um, Standish Brothers. That's what was back there in Rapidad, Virginia. And uh, anyway, prayed because it's a long ways from Sacramento back there. And she prayed about it. And they said, well, if the Lord's, if her house sells, then it was God's will. So how'd she, how'd she work that out? Or how did it work out? She lowered the price. The house sold and she went back there. <laughs> now, come on. Uh, That's not the most best way to do the things. <laughs> anyway. Well, as we know from reading Romans 9 through 11, Paul had a real burden for his Jewish compatriots. So he chose to repeat the promises from Deuteronomy 30 to the Jewish Christians. Romans 10, 6 through 10. But the scripture says about being put right with God through faith is this. You are not to ask yourself, who will go up into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Nor are you to ask, who will go down to the world below? That is, to bring Christ up from death. That it, what it says is this, God's message is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the message of faith that we preach. If, we confess, if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from death, you will be saved, for it is by our faith we are put right with God. It is by our confession that we are saved. Good news, Bible. Wow. Okay. Once again, we note that the only role that we can play in salvation is choosing to follow God in faith and obedience. So what, what's the one thing that we get to do? choose. So what should be included in our following of God? What does it mean to worship Him? We've already noted in previous lessons that God is one, there is no other God, and He rejects the ideas of any rivals. So how do we explain this? Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4, 19. Do not be tempted to worship and serve what you see in the sky. The sun, I, I cannot help it, but I have to make a comment. Yeah. The sun, the day of the sun, Sunday, yeah. before Christ came to this earth, they were worshiping sun, God, mm -hmm. and continues to be worshiped today. The moon and the stars. You see, the crescent mm -hmm. Islam, mm -hmm. the stars, right. the moon. The moon as well. Yes, and the star, yes. The Lord your God has given these to all other peoples for them to worship. Goodness Bible. Okay, here's another example. You could take this, if you just take this very literally and don't add anything else to it, and think, wow, I mean, God wanted them to worship all those other things? No, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying here is that these other people had chosen, that's what they had chosen for themselves, and if you look at it like that, the Jewish people looked at it like that, they said, well, that must have been God's will because that's the way it worked out. 
This is another evidence that the book of Deuteronomy does not recognize a second supernatural force or being. Whatever happens that is beyond the ability of man to accomplish is assumed to be done by the gods. We humans cannot fully understand what the gods are doing. That was the thinking of the people that Moses was dealing with. God was not suggesting that he had given the sun, moon, stars, and other so-called gods to other nations to worship. He simply said that that was what they themselves had chosen to do. Deuteronomy 8, 19. Never forget the Lord your God or turn to other gods to worship and serve them. If you do, then I warn you today that you'll be, you will certainly be destroyed. Deuteronomy 11, verse 16. Do not let yourselves be led away from the Lord to worship and serve other gods. Deuteronomy 30, 17 to 19. We're, we're seeing here in Deuteronomy, this, these things are just repeated and repeated and repeated. So it goes on to say, but if you disobey and refuse to listen and are led away to worship other gods, you will be destroyed. I warn you here and now, you will not live long in that land across the Jordan that you're about to occupy. I am now giving you the choice between life and death, between God's blessing and God's curse. And I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make, choose life. How many times does he have to say, choose life? Choose God. Yeah, choose God. Well, well these were stiff-necked people, you know, for 400 years, their conscience was gone. Yeah. You see, so he was trying and trying to build them up. What was the attraction of those other gods? Have you ever tried to answer that question? Why would, why would someone worship the sun? Now you mentioned that, Charles. Why do people worship the sun? Because they felt that the sun was the source of life. Okay, How, why do they think the sun is the source of life? Because when the sun's gone, it's cold. Oh, and okay. their crops didn't grow. And the, crops, the crops seem to grow when the sun is shining, yeah. Why would they worship the moon? Oh, it's lovely, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and the stars, those <laughs> twinkling things up there in the sky, they're beautiful too. <laughs> There's a very interesting little bit of trivia that I'd like to share now. When we get to Revelation, we're going to talk about the number 666. Oh boy. Yeah. You know where that number comes from? In ancient times, the astronomers divided up the sky into 12 large categories. The whole sky. And then they subdivided each one of those things into sections of three. So, and each one of those assigned the name of a god. And if you learn all those names of all those uh, constellations in the heavens, they, they go by many of those names, many of those so-called names of gods. Well, what happens if you add all the, name, the numbers of all, because each, each god then has a number. What happens if you add all the numbers of all the gods together? 666. Six, six. 36 One, two, thirty-six. Yep. Six, six, six. So it was a number that symbolized the ancient gods long before we come to the Book of Revelation. But now back to our question: What was the attraction of those other gods? Was there ever any evidence that worshiping any of those gods had benefited their worshippers? Well, come on, well, you can think about it. The Assyrians believed that their god was more powerful because it helped them win the wars. Win the war. Win the wars. And they won lots of wars. And they won lots of wars. Is that a, is that a valid reason for for worshiping the god of war? Well, it would be a convincing thing for those that thought maybe that might be. Yeah, that's just one example. We could we could think of others. Uh, the people living around uh, Lake Genesaret, uh, Lake. Galilee believed that the wind and the waves were gods, mm -hmm. and they feared it. Yeah. Well, was there ever, uh, would the real God ever allow Satan to bless his followers in any way? Did Satan help the Assyrians win wars? Does Satan bless some people today, give them lots of wealth and power and fame, fortune? Could that happen in our Musical day? Musical talents. 
the religious practice of the fertility cult, religious practices of the fertility gods used prostitutes, both male and female, to attract followers. And of course, I don't have to suggest that some people are attracted by prostitutes. Once again, notice these very clear comments. Where are we here? Yeah. My, my turn? Okay, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 4.24, because the Lord your God is like a flaming fire, he tolerates his no rivals. Deuteronomy 5.9, do not bow down to any idol or worship it, for I, the Lord your God, Excuse me, I the Lord your God and I, I am the Lord your God. And I tolerate no rivals. I bring punishment on those who hate me and are and on their descendants down to the third and fourth generation. Deuteronomy six fifteen. If you do worship other gods, the Lord's anger will come against you like fire and will destroy you completely, because the Lord your God, who is present with you, tolerates no rivals. Okay, now, let's look at that for a moment. That's a pretty blunt thing to say, right? You know, here's, here's this God. He's just brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They're a bunch of, they were a bunch of slaves. Now they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. They're a motley crew, presumably, and they tried to conquer the land of Canaan once and miserably failed. And now God's saying, I'm the most powerful, I'm not going to tolerate the, the, any other gods. I'm the only God. Did that seem very reasonable to the children of Israel at that point in time? No. To me, uh, even to this day, it appears that we are very visual people. We want to be able to see. So this God that we cannot see makes no sense, for, especially for these people. Yeah. They wanted to see something, Ashrat, yeah, standing there in the big, huge uh, um, building. It was great for them. That's number one. Number two, um, we created beings have an innate desire, need within our hearts to worship. Mm -hmm. Many of us worship ourselves, but we, we want to worship. So all along, everywhere, even to this day, all, all over the world, we find people, they want to worship. So how do modern people worship? What do they worship? We have not improved much. <laughs> well, think about worth-ship. What do we consider, what do most modern people consider of worth? Well, there's houses, and there's cars, and there's wealth, and there's... There's the down. mirror. Put it all down to money and power yeah. and fame. Where does that quote come from? A person becomes like the person or thing that they worship or admire. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Paul that, says they, they become as detestable as the things that they worship. But is there a, a statement similar to what I said? Yes. Yeah. Uh, one of the clearest places that talks about the opposite is, is, is um, Psalm... 115, I believe it is. It's very, very pretty clear there. Um, and there's a number of places in Ellen White as well. Well, when you read verses like these from Deuteronomy, it is absolutely essential to understand that God's anger or God's wrath is simply his turning away and loving disappointment and grief from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them what does he do? Leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. So when God so becomes, quote, angry or has wrath or so forth, what does he do? He gives them up. He gives so, them up, Romans 1. So those people not only don't want him, but they have many times rejected him and say, I don't want you, God. I mm -hmm. don't want you. I don't want you. I don't want you, by their actions and by their words. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Get away from me, God. And that is through, through the Bible, uh, many places in the Bible it suggests that when God is angry, he's, he steps back. He says, okay, if you don't want me, if you don't want to do things my way, just you can do it your way, and you'll see what the consequences are. God's character prevents him from forcing them to do anything, prevents us from having to do anything. 
Mm -hmm. It's not so much, it's the, God's character. That's the way God is. It's yeah. not saying, well, he could be this way. No, it's the way God is. It's not something that, that is, is there, do we have to have a tension and, and you get God out, out of line and t tweak him a little bit and then uh, all hell breaks loose, so to speak? Look at the other extreme also. There are people who are immaculate when it comes to the law. But they're some of the most unloving, godless people. Okay. Revelation 13, 1 to 15. Gary? I think it's my turn, yes. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. On each of its horns there was a crown. And on each of its heads there was a name that was insulting to God. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. If you read, if you jump back to Revelation 12, you find out that there's another beast that looks almost exactly like this. Two beasts that almost look the same. See if we can figure out what they, what, who they are. The beast looked like a leopard with feet like a bear's feet and a mouth like a lion's mouth. And in brackets it says, compare the beasts in Daniel 7, 4 to 7. What you'll see there is that if you combine all the heads and horns and everything from Daniel 7 into one beast, you get this kind of a beast. The dragon gave the beast his own power, his throne, and his vast authority. Now I'm going to interrupt again. Back in Daniel, I mean, not back in Daniel, back in Revelation 12, it, the first beast it, that it talks about the sound looks like this, it specifically says it's the who? It's Satan. It's Satan. It's right. the dragon. Right. Okay, so we know who the first beast is. Go ahead. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshipped the beast also, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? The beast was allowed to make proud claims which were insulting to God, and it was permitted to have authority for 42 months. Mm. It began to curse God, his name, the place where he lives, and all of those who live in heaven. It was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them, and it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. All people living on earth will worship it. I'm going to interrupt here for a second. We'll talk about this again in a minute. All people living on earth will worship it, except... Yes, yes, they have to accept. accept. Okay. Except those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the Lamb that was killed. Okay, so if it was written in the book before the world was created, someone has to have foreknowledge, right? Yes. Does there have to be predestination? Mm. Well, that's the other option. Go ahead. Listen then, if you have ears. Whoever is meant to be captured will surely be captured. Whoever is meant to be killed by the sword will surely be killed by the sword. This calls for endurance and faith on the part of God's people. Then I saw another beast which came up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb's horns, and it spoke like a dragon. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second again. When you think of a lamb's horns, does that scare you? You can't, you can hardly even find those. Not if they're a lamb, you can hardly even find those horns. It's, they're all covered with wool and so forth and the top of the head. I just, my son just sent me some pictures of his daughters petting a baby lamb. No sign of any horns anywhere. Now, they're, they're probably down in there somewhere, but you, you would, this would not seem dangerous at all, would it? No. But then, but then what happens? What does it do? It used the vast authority of the first beast in, the, beast rather, in its presence. It forced the earth and all who live on it to worship the first beast, whose wound had healed. This second beast performed great miracles. It made fire come down out of heaven to earth in the sight of everyone. 
and it deceived all the people living on earth by means of miracles, the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. The beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. This came from the Good News Bible. Okay, Carrie, thank you for a long reading there. So we have in, the, in, in, in Revelation 12 and 13 a dragon, first of all, then a first beast, and then a second beast. Yeah. And God's response is Revelation 14, which we don't have time to cover right now. Can you say it in five words? Yes, he says anybody who does follow these three, this evil triumvirate, will, be, will, be, will perish, clearly. All the reformers believed that the first beast was uh, Rome, the first of the two beasts. Yeah. And John Newton, even in the early 1700s, says the second beast is not too far from us. Isaac Newton. Yeah. John Newton? Isaac, Isaac Newton is, is John Newton, was a reformer. Anyway, after reading Revelation 13, is it clear to you why God responds as he does in Revelation 14, 6 through 12? I'm just looking there. I don't think we have time to read that. We Adventists believe that that is our main message to the world. So we are, we are up against something that's going to sweep the world. A message that's going to involve everybody. So I'm going to ask some questions now. What would cause almost everyone on this earth to worship the devil and or his earthly associates? In our day, what do people worship? What would cause communists, atheists, yeah. evolutionists, Muslims, Hindus, etc., and lots of Christians to worship any common being or thing? What would cause them all to worship the one thing? Right now, it's hard to imagine. <laughs> it's coming. It's, uh, could, could even COVID be a part of this? You know, I mean, this is not conspiracy theory, but you know, come to think, I think the whole thing is one word, control. Mm -hmm. Whoever controls you, and that's economy. So, mm -hmm. I, and now the environment is being thrown into that. Well, think of what's happening now on the East Coast, for example. Yeah. A terrible loss of life from well, all the... Down Louisiana, too. Yeah, well, to the South and the East, yeah. And pretty soon, if that gets worse and worse, people are going to say, okay, who's in charge here? Yes, actually, you have to look the at... The gods. The gods, yes. No, they had already Muslims. People have chosen the Pope as the moral right. authority right. over the Well, because God is causing all this havoc, they think, then we need to have somebody who can talk to God. Win his favor. Yeah. Notice that our Bible study guide takes us to Revelation to bring in the great controversy which is not really mentioned in Deuteronomy. I'm not knocking Deuteronomy, I just want this point to be clear. There's one thing we need to notice in looking at the great controversy in these passages in Revelation 13 and 14. God does not use force. The devil will use force if he can possibly get away with it. But God never uses force. God only attracts with love. Beautiful. Ellen White from The Desire of Ages said, The earth was dark through misapprehension of God, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. Not done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one being in all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth of love of God 
could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healings in his wings. Malachi 4.2. And it's from, those are from the opening pages of Desire of Ages, page 22 specifically. Okay, now the question is, did the life and death of Jesus reveal clearly the difference between God and Satan? It did, but how many people saw it? Well, that wasn't the question I asked. <laughs> well, but that's part of it. Yes. Are we as the Seventh-day Adventist Christians inclined to worship any other gods? What kind of god might we worship in our day? Remember that whatever we considered to be of greatest worth to us could be our god. It is important to notice that even if someone were to choose to rebel against God, that one will not end up in any eternal torment or in a never-ending lake of fire. Well, how can we know that for sure? In the Great Controversy, page 544, paragraph 1. The wages of sin is death, but the gift God, of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6, 23. While life is the inheritance of the righteous, death is the portion of the wicked. Moses declared to Israel, I have set before thee this day life and good, and death and evil. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. The death referred to in these scriptures is not that pronounced upon Adam, for all mankind suffer the penalty for his transgression. It is the second death that is placed in contrast with the everlasting life. Okay, Deuteronomy 5, I mean, Great Controversy 544. In that connection, consider this question. Does God directly punish those who rebel against him, even now in this life? Or does he just allow consequences to take effect? Or could it be both? It is very interesting to notice that when she was asked repeatedly about the general conference session in eight, held in 1888, Ellen White finally gave us the, th this information. The law of Ten Commandments is not to be looked upon as much from the prohibitory side as from the mercy side. Its prohibitions are the sure guarantee of happiness in, ob in obedience. As received in Christ, it works in us the purity of character that we bring joy to us through eternal ages. The obedient is a wall of protection we behold in the goodness of God, who by revealing to men the immutable principles of righteousness seeks to shine, to shield, to shield them from the evils and results of transgression. We're not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. His own actions start, start a train of circumstances that bring the sure result. Every act of transgression re reacts upon the sinner, works in him a change of character and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. Hmm. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing and sure result is ruin and death. Ellen White, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 235. We looked at that passage last week as well, and it's a very important one. It points out some very clear issues in terms of dealing with the, with the law. So that 1888 General Conference session was probably the most important General Conference ever held by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Have you ever sat down and thought what is implied by the fact that God calls upon you to choose life instead of death? He is a commander. Is the call to, in Deuteronomy 30, 19 to choose life still applicable to us and as individuals? God calls as witnesses 
calls on witnesses to determine and watch to see whether or not his people are going to remain faithful and obedient to him. And who were those witnesses? Who would God call on to be his witnesses? Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, I am now giving you the choice between life and death, between God's blessing and God's curse, and I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Choose life. So what do we learn in this lesson about the great controversy and how it should impact our individual lives? Since the beginning of human history, we have struggled as a human race between choosing God or choosing his enemies. We do not have the option of choosing some middle ground, including some other God, some of Satan, or something, someone else. Just as there were only two trees of choice in the Garden of Eden, there are only two choices, life or death. Is it, uh, that's what's at stake. God, however, does not force them. They have between them two ways, life and death. There is their prerogative to make a choice. Moses is simply showing them the good reasons that the way of life is the right choice, and he urges them to make that, that choice. The solemnity of this appeal is, as in the ancient covenant treaties, supported by witnesses who guarantee the validity of the covenant. In this instance, the witnesses, uh, witnesses are cosmic, heavens and earth as if the fate of the earth, salvation of the world was at stake. If Israel fails to make the right choice, the whole project of the coming of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is compromised. From our Bible study guide, page 107. So why does God challenge us to choose him? Wouldn't it have been better if he just made it obligatory that we choose him? Would we be willing to give up our freedom and our ability to choose? Without freedom, there's no opportunity for love. Someone said that the difference between the philosopher and the biblical prophet is that the philosopher makes you think while the prophet makes you choose. How does that sound? You think that's true? Is God asking too much of us? Man lost all because he chose to listen to the deceiver rather than to him who is truth, who alone has understanding. By the mingling of evil with good, his mind had become confused, his mental and spiritual powers benumbed, no longer could he appreciate the good thing, good that God had so freely bestowed. And we're running out of time here. What is wrong with wanting to be like God? That's what Satan offered or seemed or suggested he was offering to, to Eve, the only way to know good and evil is not, as the serpent said, to know or experience the evil and the good, uh, um, but to know only the good. Indeed, as soon as humans knew evil, they lost the capacity to discern between good and evil. And we, we need to close there. Let's pray. Uh, Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to worship and serve you to realize that you are the only God. There is no other. There's nothing else that we should consider of value and equal to you. Now, as we study your word together, we thank you for the privileges we have of seeing it clearly. May these lessons in Deuteronomy bring us closer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.